Please listen carefully. Well, hello, universe. Welcome to the Optimist Daily Update. I'm Summer Sakai. And I'm Amelia Buckley. And we are part of the team behind the Optimist Daily Making Solutions the News. We bring you reader-funded solutions news every day in order to change the tenor of news media, social media, and the direction of your day to one focused on solutions. Seven days a week, we publish positive news stories written by award-winning journalists and delivered online to your inbox and through our social channels. And also, we are sharing these solutions in a commute-worthy, walk-worthy, home office-worthy podcast. Today is Thursday, the 1st of October. October 2020. Well, Amelia, it's here. October has arrived. How are you? I'm good. I actually greeted the new month pretty early this morning. I woke up at six o'clock and was wide awake, surprisingly. So I decided to go for a little run before it got really hot here today. So I'm feeling pretty energized this morning. That is very ambitious of you. Well done. I'm excited that uh, you got to go for a run. And definitely before it gets too hot. Is it hot up in Santa Barbara? It is. We didn't have any fog this morning, so it's already about 75, I would say, and it's 9 a.m. Yes, we are definitely having that extended summer around here. It is warm near my home as well. And this morning, I also, as you know, was up bright and early, and we took Cleo for her morning exercise where Brennan and I throw a ball. And the sun also, no fog, the sun was bursting through in a very bright way, and I actually needed sunglasses at 6.30 a.m. Well, 7 a.m. Anyway, so there's some optimism with the beautiful rising sun in this October month. There's lots of good things happening this month, right? We've got Halloween. We've got two full moons, I think, right? Yesterday was, or Mm -hmm. last night was a full moon and Halloween is a full moon. And we have our emotional inflammation webinar coming up next Friday on the 9th. Yes. So people should register for that. It's going to be exciting. We have our two guests that we had last week, Lise and Stacy, that we interviewed are going to be back for a webinar. Yes. Lisa and Stacy will definitely be back. And also, Christy may return to us at some point. We may get Christy back here on the podcast, but, you know, if we do, if we don't, it is what it is. <laughs> fingers <laughs> crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed. Miss her a lot. But how did you spend your day yesterday? I know work was busy. Anything interesting to share? Not really. I, yeah, just worked most of the day, and I'm actually going to San Diego for the weekend. My boyfriend and I rented an Airbnb down there, so we're going to go do a little staycation-ish down in San Diego. So I was packing and getting ready for that, too. Oh, I love it. You know, the Airbnb market and all of the vacation rental market is just through the roof. All of the vacation rentals in my neighborhood for holiday are already booked. It's crazy. We are kind of trying to figure out what we're going to do for Thanksgiving or holiday. And it's amazing because people just want to go somewhere other than their homes. Definitely, if you own an Airbnb, now is a prime time for you. Well, today, the Optimist Daily has some pretty fascinating stories. We've got jetpacks and cheetahs and gardens. What got you excited to read the Optimist Daily today, Amelia? One that I really liked, actually, I've written a lot of stories for us about co-ops. I personally am a big fan of co-ops. I'm a member of one that's a little local grocery store here. But one that I wanted to highlight was the story, New Project is Saving Dying Restaurants by Giving Ownership to Employees. So this is a new project called the Main Street Phoenix Project that's actually in Denver, as opposed to what its name would suggest. (laughs) But it is giving... Distressed restaurants, basically, instead of going out of business, it's giving the employees an opportunity to buy the restaurant together and turn it into a co-op restaurant. This is in really high demand right now with the pandemic because we're seeing a lot of restaurants facing hard times and facing going out of business. So this is basically an alternative that allows these little community restaurants to stay in business, stay afloat, and provides financial security for these employees because they now have an ownership stake in the place that they work at. The project is just getting off the ground, but they're planning on buying their first restaurant by the end of the year, and they plan to acquire 25 more over the next two years. 
So they're focusing on family-owned restaurants, struggling businesses, and restaurants that have even already closed to basically help these employees, give them the loans that they need to buy the restaurants themselves, and then they'll pay them back as they continue to flourish. So you've written a lot about co-op, and just for everyone who's listening, you may have heard the term co-op, you may be somewhat familiar, but what exactly are the tactics behind a co-op? How how does a co-op employee-owned restaurant work? Co-op is short for cooperative, and there's a lot of different types of them. If you're interested, we wrote a view, I think a few months ago, about them that goes into more detail. You can have community co-ops where residents of the community all own a stake in them. A lot of the grocery store ones are that model. You can have employee co-ops where all of the employees own a stake in it. Some of the common ones you might know are REI. And actually, there's less well-known ones like Ocean Spray. The cranberry brand is actually a co-op also. So some of the big businesses that you know are co-ops too. And essentially, it just gives the employees more autonomy. It gives them a voice, and since they have a stake in ownership, there also have been studies that have shown that employees that are owners of co-ops are more invested in their jobs, they have lower turnover rates. It's essentially giving the power back to the workers and creating more empowered workers. It also is a way of diversifying the obligation, right? So if employees own it, then there is a collaborative ownership model instead of a single owner whose entire portfolio may be resting in just one restaurant. So the single owner is at a higher risk than a co-op situation. Co-ops are still managed by CEOs. They still have the same kind of executive structure, but the risk is mitigated by a co-op structure. And we talk a lot about diversifying our portfolios, whether it's diversifying our portfolios for affecting climate change, you know, never having a siloed solution. And that in effect is what a co-op does as well. So I think it's really interesting. I know that some restaurants are seeing an absolute boon because they have been able to convert really quickly into takeout and delivery based businesses and other restaurants that are not in that vein have really been challenged. So COVID has been a very interesting time because for some businesses and for some individuals, it has resulted in abundance. And that is a very strange thing to think about because there are a lot of people for whom it has not. So I like to see a lot of different solutions around helping people through this time. And hopefully they can get circular takeout containers. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, let's hope. It's interesting that you mentioned how some businesses are doing well and some aren't because I know Santa Barbara, we have such a mild climate here that the restaurants have been really effective at transitioning to outdoor dining. But This project is based in Denver, where I imagine the weather is turning colder very quickly and outdoor dining might not be as feasible. Yeah, exactly. We're going to lose that as the seasons change, losing that ability for outdoor dining. So normally we come up with a really creative and innovative way to transition from one story to the other, but we're just going to fly right over to my story today. Hey, look, I did it. I win. (laughs) That was pretty good. That was pretty good. My headline reads, Jet suits could soon help paramedics reach remote areas in no time. So I don't mean to sound like the sci-fi technophobe, right? You know, the drones are coming and plastic eating microbes are going to eat our houses and everybody's going to be flying around in jetpacks. But guess what? That's actually the future. (laughs) The jetpack story that I like comes out of the UK. It is a great, innovative way of recognizing that remote medicine and helping people who are in remote places could be better serviced by jetpacks. A company in England has created a groundbreaking exercise run by an air ambulance service that has recently demonstrated in one of the country's mountainous regions, a healthcare worker swooping in on a jetpack and saving lost hikers. Now, of course, this was all an exercise and this was not actually a real circumstance where somebody really needed to be saved. But the jetpack navigated rocky hillsides of the Lake District in northwest England. And the navigator, I guess the pilot, right, the jetpack pilot and healthcare worker could be seen shooting across treacherous terrains at heights between 10 and 20 feet in search of a party of walkers simulating a casualty scenario. The exercise was a culmination of a long 
discussion between the Great North Air Ambulance Services, GNOS, and Gravity Industries, according to Andy Mawson, who's the Director of Operations and Paramedics at GNOS. It's pretty cool to think about that individual human flight could be used. And I know that, you know, we often have stories here in California because people are hiking all the time. I guess all over the world this happens where hikers get lost or, you know, parties get separated when they're in mountainous terrains. And the amount of time that it would take to find somebody could be days, whereas with a jetpack could be hours. So I love this story. I think it's kind of fun. I would love to fly in a jetpack. <laughs> and I think that's a pretty optimistic idea. I think there's a lot to choose from on the Optimist Daily today, but jetpacks seem to perfectly align with all of the other stories I have talked about this week. I'm intrigued by this because normally they use helicopters for rescue missions, but the jetpack offers the advantage that you can get a lot closer to the ground than you can in a helicopter. So improved visibility and getting down low to find people, I think, would be one of the predominant advantages of it. Right. Well, and also covering big areas with jetpacks is probably not as realistic. But if you have information that you know a relatively refined area where a hiker might have disappeared or been injured, or even if you are in communication with the hiker who has been injured, you can get right to them. The helicopters and other, you know, air ambulance is certainly going to be, you know, once you've got the hiker, you're going to put them into the helicopter to zoom them to the nearest hospital if the injuries are severe. But I like that this is an extension of their capabilities as well. So I feel even better about getting out hiking, although it has been quite some time since I was regularly hiking. <laughs> I did have kind of an exciting thing happen yesterday, speaking of hiking and outdoorsing. As I mentioned, Brennan and I have been going to a local private pool. And yesterday she was napping when we got there. And my friend who's in my mom pod, my socially distant quarantined mom pod, I guess we're not socially distant because we're all kind of quarantining together. But my friend who was in my mom pod said, just leave her in her car seat right by the pool with me and you go swim some laps. And I actually swum laps for 20 minutes yesterday, which is the first time I think I have swum laps in almost two years. Sounds so nice. I'm missing swimming laps. I miss the pool. It was heavenly to get to actually swim laps. And, you know, I know that we may be entering a more aggressive lockdown and I feel like the pool may be taken away from me really soon, but we are being responsible and it is such a gift that I am able to do it right now. I am so grateful for it. Speaking of other things that I'm grateful for, there's a headline, yet another headline about pets. This one is how to enjoy the comfort of pets without actually owning one, which is funny, Amelia, because what were we talking about before we started recording today? We were talking about how tempted I am to get a pet, even though I do not have the space or time for one. (laughs) (laughs) As we were doing our morning check-in, I quote-unquote brought Amelia a cup of coffee, aka I got one myself, and I came back holding my big furry Maine Coon cat copper. Basically, I was trying to offer her some kitty cat love through the screen. And uh, this story is great because it talks about some of the ways that you can interact with animals. You can, you know, borrow them or pet sit or foster. So even if you couldn't have a pet yourself, Amelia, you could foster kittens. Just that's true. Saying kittens <laughs> need fostering. Well, speaking what? of something that's a little bigger than a kitten, this project in South Africa is seeing cheetah populations recover. It's a good one about the rise of cheetahs in South Africa. We've got another story about animals. It's a big animal day today on the Optimist Daily. French law tightens regulations on keeping wild animals in captivity. So this is a law that is banning the breeding of wild animals in traveling zoos and in marine parks. So they're not going to be able to have whales or dolphins in marine parks anymore, and they're not going to have large animals in traveling circuses. We've also got Cactus Leather Boxing Gloves Pack a Sustainable Punch. It comes from a company called Deserto, which is a Mexican-based company that is making boxing gloves out of cactus leather, which is super interesting and sustainable. What else do we have today? Let's see. We have a story about the number of young black authors doubles to nearly 20% in the United Kingdom. A guide to growing a garden to feed your whole family. And as you know, We're kind of reallocating or reorganizing how we're thinking about where we're going to live for now. 
and we may just stay right where we are. So I am going to look at actually planting things my family can eat. A hydrogen-powered commercial aircraft successfully completes its maiden flight. And last but not least, we've got a story about how to reach the flow state in our distracted world. And that's just some good self-care tactics on how to increase your productivity in this really, really weird time. It's a lot of good reads today on the Optimist Daily Update. We're kind of brief in our in our check-in today. We're kind of all over the place, but I think that's just because I think we're both kind of ready for the weekend. We've got one more day to go, and then Amelia's off to San Diego, and I am off to the pool. But we're not there yet. So for now, thank you everyone for listening to the Optimist Daily Update. We promise to continue to share positive, solution-based stories with ideas on how you can participate in this changing world and ensure it is changed for the good. We promise to cover the current events with accuracy, legitimate sources, and offer you the information needed most to chart new paths for all of us. Please consider becoming an emissary on theoptimistdaily.com and for just $5 a month, support reader-funded independent journalism. Be part of the solution-changing consciousness and addressing our world's biggest challenges with a problem-solving mindset. Let's keep The Optimist Daily free to all who need it, supported by those who can. Thank you guys for tuning in today, and we will be back tomorrow morning. One more day to go. So every time I stop talking, the damn jackhammer stops. I didn't, I can't hear it at all. So you're good. All right. All right fine. I'm stopping recording.